Good evening, everyone. Thank you for being here. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. John 1, verses 12 and 13. This is VBS season. See the signs up all over. A lot of, uh, a lot of churches are having their vacation Bible school at this time. And I remember a story one time the song leader was telling me about a VBS that he was song leader. They got to the point where the lessons were over and they were having sort of the big roundup, everybody in the auditorium with all the kids and the parents there. And they were singing some songs before they said a prayer and, and left for the evening. And he's up front and the first couple of pews have got, you know, all the kids up front and they're doing all of the, of the fun songs that the kid likes to do, you know, with all the hand motions and everything. You know, they're rolling the gospel chariot along and they love to roll right over Satan. They, that's their favorite part, seems to really want to roll all over him. And then but, uh, some other songs that, that maybe you'd be familiar with, they got to where they were going to do one that was, you know, the thing where you go, here's the church, here's the steeple, and they were going to sing the song along with that. And the song leader said he started to sing that song, and he noticed right when he said that, here's the church, here's the steeple, and he saw in the front row there was a little boy, and he had his hands up like this, but one of his hands had a cast. He'd hurt his wrist or something, and the cast went all the way up, and just his fingertips were sticking out, so he was just kind of sitting there like this. And he said just in, the, in a millisecond, he felt the flash of, oh, I feel so, so sad for that, for that little boy. I wish I'd have noticed that. I maybe would have picked another song, and he just, all this was going on very quickly. But before he could really react, he said there was a little girl sitting right next to him. And, you know, this was his bad hand, this was his good hand. She was sitting over on his left. And she looked over there, and she stuck her hand over like this. So his good hand and her hand, and she said, let's, make, let's build the church together. And he went, she got it. That little girl got it. Let's build the church together. The church is often referred to as a brotherhood. Now that gives an indication more of a family than a club or just a, a group. And it is a family. It, it must be a family. Brother Dan Winkler suggested in an article that he wrote many years ago that there are three brotherhoods really that we need to be concerned about as, as Christians. Of course, I'm sure there's more, but for the, for the thoughts uh, limited to this, there were three that we'll consider tonight. Uh, there were three that Brother Winkler pointed out. He said, first, there's the family of man. There's the family of Israel. And there's the family of Christ. And these are the things that are the, the three families that we really want to be concerned about. And, and we all are a part of the family of mankind. And God chose the family of Israel to be his special people, his special chosen nation at one time. The question we want to ask ourselves is, are we part of that nation? Or are we part of some other nation, some other family? So the question we want to pose tonight and consider here is, which family or families are we a part of? And what are my responsibilities to the other members of that family? So first, let's identify some of these families and see if we are members of them or not, or if we should be members of that family or not. So which family are we considering? First of all, the family of man. In Acts chapter 17, beginning in verse 24, Paul at this time is in Athens. He's on his missionary journey. He is in Athens, which is in Greece. Not a terribly uh, Jewish or Christian friendly place. And he is up speaking at a place called the Areopagus, or Mars Hill. This was a place where all the best and the brightest philosophers would go and just debate and hash things out. And, uh, and, you know, test new theories. And, and they wanted to hear this, this new teaching from Paul. So he was teaching them. And he addresses these, this group of people who were used to worshiping lots of different gods. He notes on the way up, on the walk up to the hill, there was lots of gods, little statues. He said, you guys have got a god for everything, it seems. So you're very religious. But they were missing the mark about something very important. So in Acts chapter 7, and verse 24... Paul says, God, who made the world and everything in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth, 
does not dwell in temples made with hands, nor is he worshipped with men's hands as though he needed anything, since he gives life to all. Uh, to all. He gives to all life, breath, and all things. And he has made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on all the face of the earth, and has determined their pre-appointed times and the boundaries of their dwellings, so that they should seek the Lord in the hope that they might grope for him and find him, though he is not far from each of us. For in him we live and move and have our being, as also some of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. But who is the family of man? Well, it's everyone. All human beings are, in a very real sense, the children of God. We are made in God's image. Now, Paul was appealing to everyone that he spoke to in Athens. It wasn't one certain group, one certain race. He was appealing to everyone. The family of man includes all of humanity. As Isaiah wrote about in Isaiah chapter 64, he talked about God being the potter. He said that he has made us all out of clay. He is the potter, and he has fashioned us all out of clay. That's everybody. Everyone was made by God. Even those who reject God were still made by God. Very irritating to them, but it's nonetheless true. In Genesis chapter 3 and verse 20, Adam's wife Eve is referred to as the mother of all who live. Of how many who live? All who live. Eve is all of our mothers. We are her children. And we are together in that grouping as the family of man. But it's important to notice that God chose a special relationship that he wanted to have with one people through one certain man. That man was Abraham. Next family we want to consider is the family of Israel. The family of Israel came about through God's covenant with Abraham. In Deuteronomy chapter 7, in verses 6 through 9, we're told who the family of Israel is, the nation of Israel, the family of Israel, are those who had been brought out of bondage in Egypt. The Hebrew slaves who had been brought out uh, by Moses with the mighty hand of God, producing all of those plagues and miracles. So that's who the nation of Israel was. That was who God made the covenant with. Uh, back in chapter 5 of Deuteronomy, we learned there that the Old Testament, the Old Covenant, the Law of Moses, uh, was made with those who were alive at Mount Sinai. Again, a very specific people, a specific nation. In the New Testament, in John chapter 8, uh, the Jews refer to themselves as descendants of Abraham. And they were very prideful about this fact, and they felt that it set them apart from families of all other mankind. So we are the descendants of Abraham, of the family of Israel. But Paul wrote in the fourth chapter of Romans that the promise that was made to Abraham was not made through the law, was not made through that covenant on Mount Sinai with that one specific people. Rather, he goes on to explain in chapter 9 of Romans, specifically, uh, specifically verses 6 through 8, that he says, those who are truly the children of Abraham are the children of promise, not those who are of Abraham according to the flesh. He says, not those who can trace their, their DNA, if you will, back to Abraham, but those who are children of promise, spiritual children. So the promise that was made to Abraham was of a bigger family, if I want to use that word, and that family was going to come through the seed, which we know to be Jesus Christ, the promise of Messiah, the descendant of Abraham, but the one who would unite all into the family of Jesus. The third family we're going to consider tonight. The family of Jesus. Galatians chapter 3 and verse 29 said that we are Abraham's seed if we belong to Christ. That is, we are the descendants of, of Abraham if we belong to Christ. And that's true of every Christian. You are of the family of Christ. In Ephesians chapter 4, that great passage about the ones in verses 4 through 6 tells us there is one body, one faith, and one Father over all. One Father, one group of children. Children of God and the family of God, the family of Christ. Jesus had told Nicodemus when Nicodemus came to him and asked him, you know, how one can enter the kingdom, how one can seek righteousness. And Jesus told him that you need to be born again. But he had to explain to him 
What he meant by that, he says, everyone is born of the flesh. It's a fact. Every person sitting here tonight or that is walking the face of the earth has been born. That's a fact. But he says, in order to enter the kingdom, in order to enter that family, you must be born again. And it was that that he had the discussion with Nicodemus about exactly how one goes about that. But he says, just because you're in one family doesn't automatically put you in another. But the family of Christ is the household of God, according to 1 Timothy 3.15. The church is referred to as the household of God. Well, who's in the household? Well, the children are. The family. So we see the three families are the family of man, the family of Israel, the family of Jesus. If the church is the household of God, I don't know about your household, but in our household, there are certain responsibilities, certain duties. Uh, our oldest son uh, mows the lawn, our oldest grandson, you know, takes out the trash, and the youngest grandson helps to sweep the floor, and they all have various chores and duties, you know, that they're responsible for, and I have my chores as well that I'm responsible for. Everybody has responsibilities and duties. So what we'll look at next is the responsibilities that we bear in each of those families. So we'll begin back with the family of man. Who is the family of man again? Well, it's everybody. Everyone is in the family of man. What are our responsibilities as members of that family? Well, Galatians 6.10, Paul writes that we are to do good to all, not just to those who are Christians, not just to those who are fellow church members with us, members of the body, but to all people. We are to do good to all men. That's a responsibility we have. Uh, the golden rule, uh, as Jesus pointed out in his Sermon on the Mount, do unto <coughs> others as you would have them do unto you. There's no limitations on that. Uh, no ID checks required to see if someone qualifies for you to treat them the way that you would want to be treated. We have responsibility to treat everyone that way. Paul uh, worded it this way in Romans chapter 12 and verse 18. He says, If possible, as much as depends on you, live peaceably with all men. How many men? All men. Everyone in the family of man. What's our responsibility? Try to live peaceably with them as much as depends on us. They may not want to, they may not allow you to live in peace with them, but as, your, as far as your part goes, your responsibility, your side of the fence, you say, I'm going to do my best to live at peace with all men. The responsibility we bear just as a member of the family of men. What about prayer? 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 1 says, Prayer should be made for all Christians. No, that's not what Paul wrote to Timothy. He said, prayers are to be offered for all men. Not just males, but mankind. We understand the biblical uh, language there. Prayers are to be made for all men people everywhere. No limitations, no restrictions. We can pray for anybody. Even our bitterest enemy, even the, the most horrible person that we hear this terrible news story about on the other side of the world. We can and should be praying for them. The responsibility we bear as a member of the family of man. Paul also told Timothy in his second letter, chapter 2 and verse 24, that, we, that the servant of the Lord, who we should all hope to aspire to be, we should all act like a servant of the Lord, that if you want to be a servant of the Lord, you must be gentle to all. All means all. So we are to do good to all. We are to treat others the way we want to be treated. Uh, we are to try to live peaceably with all men. We're to pray for them. We're to be gentle to everyone. And Titus chapter 3 and verse 2 says a Christian ought to show humility to all men. Quite a list. Maybe you see one or two of those that you're not doing so well in. I see several. For myself, but those are our responsibilities as a member of the family. Again, I don't know how it is in your household, but when one person in the family doesn't uphold their responsibilities, it falls on someone else, and it causes problems. It causes irritation, particularly on the part of the adults. So we don't want there to be friction. There's going to be conflict, but we should try our best to limit them. So if we are of the family of man, and everyone here is, we need to try to keep these responsibilities that we've, just, that we've just laid out here. And this is not an exhaustive list. That's not the end of it. There's plenty more to be found. I just suggested a few. Well, that's the family of man. What about the family of Israel? What is my responsibility? What is our responsibility as Christians to the family of Israel? Well, the question we need to ask, first of all, again, is who is of the family of Israel? And the answer, although it may seem unkind, it may seem harsh, Today, the family of Israel is nobody. 
the nation of Israel, religiously, spiritually, biblically, is gone. After the temple was destroyed in 70 AD by the Roman army, that was it. That was the final nail in the coffin of the biblical, religious nation of Israel. There is a geographical and political nation of Israel that exists today. But they are not in that same covenant relationship with God the way Israel in the Bible was. In Ephesians chapter 2, and verse 11, we see how this has come about and what this means. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 11, Paul is writing to the church in Ephesus and he's reminding them that they were Gentiles at one time and they were not Jews. And, and we need to understand that in the background of this. In verse 11, Paul says, Therefore, remember that you, once Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, made in the flesh by hands, that at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now, in Christ Jesus, you, who once were far off, have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made both one, and has broken down the middle wall of separation, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, that is, the law of commandments contained in ordinances, so as to create in himself one new man from the two, thus making peace, that he might reconcile them both to God in one body through the cross, thereby putting to death the enmity. And he came and preached peace to you who were far off and to those who were near. For through him we both have access to one spirit to the Father. Now therefore you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. So Paul says, you were Gentiles, you were not Jews, you were not of the nation of Israel, and you were outside of God. You had no relationship with them. No part of the covenants, no part of the promises, no part of the blessing. But now, because Jesus came and has taken the law out of the way, he's nailed it to the cross, he's abolished it with his blood, and he has instituted the new covenant of the church. That now is the people of God, the family of God. He says, that is who you are a member of now, and you have access to God. You are part of the household of God. See, the Gentiles were apart from God, but the law was abolished through the cross, and now we are all fellow citizens in the kingdom. We are all fellow members in the family of God. Not just one nation, not just one people anymore. Uh, as Paul wrote about it in Galatians chapter 3 and verse 26, he says, Now in Christ, in the church, in the family of God, there is, there is no Jew nor Greek, but we are all sons and daughters of God through our baptism. We are baptized into the family, into Christ. All, he says, all are one in Christ, one family. The family of Jesus, the family of Israel, that covenant has passed, so we have no responsibilities uh, to any of those members because now there is one family, the family of Jesus. Now, who could that be? Family of man is everybody. Family of Israel, religiously, now is nobody. But the family of Jesus could be anybody. It's available to anyone. Again, no restrictions. Luke chapter 24 and verse 47, as Jesus is giving that uh, rendering of the what we call the Great Commission there, sending the apostles out to preach the gospel. And he sends them to preach repentance and forgiveness in the name of Christ, and that this should be proclaimed to all nations. Not just one nation, not just one geographical area, but he said this needs to go in the whole world to everybody, all people. Mark 16, 16, Jesus says, Whoever believes and is baptized shall be saved. Anybody. Whosoever. When the question was asked of, uh, of Peter and the apostles in Acts chapter 2, verse 38, after Jesus had ascended on Pentecost Day, they say, How shall we be saved? Peter said, Whoever repents and is baptized will be saved. 
when someone confronted Jesus and were taking issue with his teaching, and then his family had come from Nazareth. And they said, oh, Jesus, hey, your, your family's here. Your mother and your brothers and your sisters, they've, they've all come to see you. And there was a big crowd, and they, and they can't get in to see you. And Jesus opened his arms to the crowd around him, and he said, these are my, are my family. These are my brothers and my sister and my mother. Those who do the will of God. That is who is in the family of Jesus. So we have responsibilities to those in each of these families. We bear responsibility to the families of mankind and to the church. Uh, but we bear perhaps the greatest responsibility to the head of the family, and that's God. This is what we'll close with this evening. Based upon our membership or non-membership in these different families, what is our responsibility to God? If we are of the children of God, if we are in the family of Christ in the church, what are our responsibilities to God who is the head of that family? Well, one of our most important responsibilities is to grow the family, to nurture it. Turn over to 1 John chapter 1, if you will, with me. 1 John chapter 1. Beginning in verse 1, John writes, That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled, concerning the word of life, the life was manifested, and we have seen and bear witness and declare to you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested to us, that which we have seen and heard, we declare to you that you may also have fellowship with us. And truly our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. Now how does that show our responsibility to God? Well, one of our responsibilities is to see that the family of God grows. John talks about fellowship. He says we have fellowship with one another. And we have fellowship with God. We're all in it together. And he says, we, you know, myself, John, I was an apostle. I was with Jesus and I'm testifying you to the things that we witnessed. We walked around with him for three years and we saw these things and we heard these words and we witnessed the miracles. And he said, we saw these things and experienced them and we are now telling them to you. Why? Well, read the end of John's Gospel and he tells you, I've written these things so that you may believe and that believing in Christ you may have eternal life. He says, we experience these things, we're sharing them with you to give you the hope that we have found. We have come into the family of Christ and we want you to come in as well. That responsibility falls to us. We need to grow the family. We can't just be happy and say, I got mine. I'm here, made it safe, you know, slid into home, barely missed a tag and now I'm good and then my worries are over. We need to try to be bringing others in to this family. John also tells us that another responsibility we have here is to abide in God. If you look in chapter 2 of 1 John, he talks about how we need to abide in God. Abide means to make your home there. Not just visiting, not just passing through. It means to make your home there. We need to make our home in God and with God. One way that we do that in verse 6 of John, 1 John chapter 2 is by walking as he walked, following Christ's footsteps, trying to do what he did, trying to act as he did. That's one way that we abide in God, and we have a responsibility to do that. Christ is our example, and he's given us that example to follow. That's our responsibility. In chapter 3, verses 6 and 9, we abide in God. We show the fact that we are abiding in God by not sinning. Not that we never stumble, not that we're perfect and never make mistakes, but we are not sinners. We need to understand the distinction there. We may sin. But I don't believe we should ever refer to ourselves as sinners, unless it's appropriate. And what I mean by that is a sinner is one who is characterized by a life of sin, as opposed to one who sins. A Christian will stumble into sin from time to time. But we should never, I believe, refer to ourselves as sinners, that we are characterized by our sin. Unless it's true, and that's a very sad situation and needs to be rectified. But in general, we show that we are abiding in God by not sinning, by not practicing that lifestyle of sin, that habitual falling into it. 
And if we are, then we need to do a serious self-examination. We are still a child of God, but we must abide in Him. We can't just be born of God and then go off on our separate way. We've got to stay in the household. We've got to stay close to Him. That's what it means to abide. We can't just say, hey God, thanks for the salvation. Now I'm off to do my own thing. That's not going to work. We must abide in God if we are going to consider ourselves of the family of God. And going down sort of backtracking chronologically, to begin that state, we must first be born of God. See this several times referred to in John's first letter. Born of God. And this phrase, be born of God, if you broke this down grammatically, you would find that this is in what is known as the perfect passive. It's in the perfect tense and the passive voice. And what that means is that this is something that is done to you and it remains to be done. That is the effects of what was done at one time stay and it remains done. It was done once to you by God and it remains done. What does that mean? That means that God made you His child. When you entered the family of God, when you entered the body of Christ, He made you His child. And you remain his child, even when we make mistakes, even when we turn our back on him. We are a wayward child, we are a rebellious child, but we remain his child. Now that doesn't give us a license to sin, but it should give us hope that we will always be welcomed home when we repent. To be born of God is to be born of the Holy Spirit. This is again something Jesus told Nicodemus in John, the third chapter of John's Gospel. We do not be born of the Holy Spirit. Now we could talk for weeks and weeks and weeks about what that means. I don't have time to detail that tonight, but the fact is that it must be done. We are born into the family of God, not by the flesh, but by the work of the Holy Spirit and by our obedience. We are born into one family by natural means. We were all born into the family of man by natural means. And we're born into another family by our choice and our actions. Now we must show love to the family of mankind in whatever way that we can. What does that mean? How does that work out in daily life? Well, for just a few suggestions, it means that we provide food when we see them hungry. It means we offer assistance to those in need. We pray for the sick for the weak, and we treat all others as we would like to be treated, no matter what their appearance or behavior towards us. In short, we do whatever we can to help others when we have the means and opportunity. That's some of what that means. Now what do you suppose is the greatest need of all human beings? It's not food, it's not shelter, it's not clothing, it's not medical care. That's not the greatest need of every human being. The greatest need that man has ever had is the need for a Savior to have their sins forgiven. Ever since man walked out of the garden, this has been our main problem. Well, if that's every human being's main need, what do you suppose is the best way that we might meet that need? I would suggest to you that we can help the family of man the most by bringing them into the family of Christ, the church. We can work to alleviate the physical suffering of the world whenever we can, and we should, but our efforts must never fall short of meeting that most important need for Christ, because we would not be good brothers and sisters to them if we did not frame everything we do in the love of their souls and the importance of it. God loves souls above everything else, and therefore, so should we. So if there is a soul tonight that is in need of the healing of Jesus, if you want to enter the family of Christ and have your sins forgiven and have that relationship with God, then we want to help you do that tonight. We'll help you obey the gospel. We'll answer questions that you may have. Or if we can offer prayers for something that you may be struggling with, we all have struggles, and we want to help you with yours. And you may help us with ours tomorrow.
But we want to be here for you and offer our support if we can. We want to pray for you. Please make that need known to us as we stand and sing this song. Please come. As I have 